Hello, students. This is Professor Gore, and on this topic, we're going to be covering the Progressive Era. Um, and this is a really important part of American history because in the Gilded Age, which we covered in Module 1 of U.S. History 2, we talked about um, really the tremendous growth of capitalism um, and how much you know wealth is created and, and it leads to a, a much larger middle class and lead a higher standard of living and so many different improvements. But at the same time, there were also many problems. Um, labor, labor unrest, uh, you had bad working conditions, uh, poor wages, uh, long hours, plus you had uh, um, a lot of dangerous industrial activity, particularly for children, you have child labor. You also had segregation that developed during the, during the Gilded Age, um, particularly in the, in the American South. You had political corruption, um, much power was, was held um, you know, by political machines and so forth. And so the progressive era is going to be trying to challenge that. And so um, in this part, first part, we're going to be talking about what was the progressive era and so forth, and uh, also talk about uh, who the muckrakers were and so forth at this time. So um, this is a quote from uh, progress about the progressive era. So they were reformers who attempted to solve problems caused by industry, growth of cities and laissez-faire. Um, really, the movement was was different than movements before. There was no agreed upon agenda, no unifying organization. Both the Republican and Democratic parties had progressive wings. So there were progressives in the Democrats and progressives in the Republicans. And then also within the Democrat and Republican Party, those that weren't in favor of progressive uh, progressivism and so forth. Um, also, and at different times and places, different social groups became active. Really, it's the middle class, though. If I could focus on one economic class as the driving force behind the progressive era, it is going to be the middle class. The term progressivism describes a widespread, many-sided effort after 1890 and 1900, all the way through World War I, to build a better society. The urban middle class was a driving force behind this movement, and progressives fought against monopolies, corruptions, inefficiency, and social injustice. Um, and really, the progressive era used the government uh, as an agency of human welfare to enact these changes. All right, so let's look at the, the types of groups that were progressive. doesn't mean that everybody that was in, this, in these groups were progressives, but progressives were typically in these categories. They were white Protestants, middle class and native born, college educated professionals, social workers. OK, that would make sense. They uh, deal with uh, what, what's happening on the front lines, scholars. Politicians. Now, there were a lot of politicians who weren't progressives, but um, there were progressive politicians. Preachers. A lot of ministers pushed for a lot of these social changes. Teachers. OK. And then also writers. So the, the economic class became the driving force behind the movement was the middle class, particularly the urban middle class. Not as much the rural middle class, but the urban middle class. So um, one of the first progressive things that was the Selman House movement started by Jane Adams in 1889 and later uh, Ellen Gates Star. Um, so progressives, some of the things you'll be fighting against, I'm going to cover um, Jane Adams and the Selma House movement in just a second, was they fought monopolies. And so we'll see that Teddy Roosevelt is going to be the first trust busting president. He's going to break up monopolies and trust. Taft, um, his successor, is going to break up actually more uh, in four years versus Teddy Roosevelt's uh, seven and a half. And then Woodrow Wilson also did as well. Corruption, particularly usually political corruption. There's going to be some uh, safeguards put in place to try to protect uh, society from political corruption. Uh, inefficiency, okay, a lot of uh, government inefficiency, uh, business inefficiency, uh, and so forth. Social injustice, child labor, um, uh, and so forth. Some of the social injustice are not going to be able to correct. For instance, segregation in the South is not going to be corrected until the civil rights movement. So the government played uh, as an agency of human welfare at this time. And it, the, a lot of progressive stuff was done at the local and state level. Yes, there are things done at the federal level, but actually more uh, progressive era things are actually enacted at the state and local level than um, the national level. Um, so the movement began. Um, some, some historians kind of start argue the progressive era kind of began with the farmers labor movement uh, that led to the populist. But remember, the populists were in favor of a lot of socialistic ideas. So the progressives are not socialist uh, at this time. They are going to um, some of the good ideas that the populists had, they're going to adopt. But the socialist ideas, they're not going to adopt. They weren't as radical as the populists at that time. So they are going to push for the government regulating industry more so than they had before. They also want to make the government more responsible to the people in terms of voting and limit the power of the political bosses. 
Um, now, they're not going to eliminate all political machines, but they're going to help regulate some of that with the direct primaries and some other things. They also want to improve workers' rights, particularly on behalf of labor, uh, and also try to improve conditions for the poor and immigrants. A lot of this stuff was like city uh, ordinances and so forth that made better and safer housing conditions for a lot of people. That's, that's done at the local city level. And then clean up the cities, both physically and, um, um, and literally, as well as figuratively, so like uh, trash cleanup and, and uh, sewers and sanitation, but also clean up city corruption. Uh, and, and one, the last thing, the insegregation of Jim Crow, that's unfortunately not gonna come about until the civil rights uh, era. Well, the populists were primarily rural, progressives were primarily urban. Populists poor and uneducated, progressives were typically middle-class and educated. Populists were too radical, the progressives were kind of more moderate for the day and age. Um, so the progressives weren't the socialists and communist parties that we have uh, in the United States at this time. Now, granted, the socialists and communists were very much a minority. Progressives kind of made up more of a moderate mainstream of society. Populists fell, while the progressives were, for the most part, uh, pretty successful. Okay. So social justice, political democracy, economic equality, and conservation. And we'll talk about all four of these areas in the Progressive Era recorded lectures. Okay, so what exactly is social justice? Well, you want to improve working conditions in industry, which were terrible. Okay, now we have all these different safety um, regulations and so forth in business. That's a good thing. Uh, regulate unfair business practices, particularly with monopolies and trust. So Teddy Roosevelt is going to use the Sherman Antitrust Act as well as Taft. And then Woodrow Wilson is going to create the Clayton Antitrust Act that's kind of a more robust and buff version of the Sherman Antitrust Act. And also help immigrants and the poor like Jane Addams and the Selman House Movement, like Walter Rauschenbusch and the Social Gospel Movement, um, trying to help recent immigrants with, with basic philanthropy and charity. Uh, political democracy, give the government back to the people. Okay, So that means this, the uh, uh, private ballot with the Australian ballot, also direct election of senators uh, and direct primaries and so forth, and, and trying to break the hold that political machines held on at city politics, state politics, and even national politics because they decided who was going to the national government. Okay, economic justice. Uh, this is fairness in the workplace. Uh, regulate monopolies. Uh, create uh, better legal rights for, for labor unions um, and so forth. Okay. And conservation, Teddy Roosevelt was our first truly conservationist uh, American president um, and held a conservation conference at, in Washington in the last year he was in the White House. Uh, but but sought to preserve natural resources for future generations. Now, he didn't believe that you should not use natural resources for economic reasons. He just thought, well, you should protect areas, use some natural resources, but you conserve a lot for the, for the betterment and future of our society and country. Let's look at uh, the Selman House movement. Okay, um, And so the whole house, as it was called uh, in Chicago, was um, a remodeled mansion on the west side, particularly they had a lot of Italian immigrants that lived there. They provided education for immigrants as well as night school for adults. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, high schools I taught at provided um, English uh, language training for immigrants uh, in the evening time. So that was used uh, kind of like what the Selman House Movement would have done. They taught immigrants in the downtrodden basic skills necessary to survive in America. At the Henry Street Selman in New York City, Lillian Wald made uh, visiting uh, nurses a major service. Mary McDowell, head of the University of Chicago Settlement, installed a bathhouse, children's playground, and citizenship school for immigrants. Jane Addams battled for uh, garbage removal, playgrounds, better street lighting, and police protection despite having the possibility of living a comfortable life as part of the middle class. Jane Addams didn't have to do any of this. Many middle class people uh, like her felt the need to get involved to help uh, meet the needs of slum dwellers. Much of this aid came from the Protestants' clergy, long felt concern for the plight of the poor. The development into the social gospel where it became a major theological doctrine to aid the poor. Okay, um, So Ellen Gates Starr and Jane Adams co-founded the Hull House um, and so forth. Then you had Lillian Wald found one in New York. Here's Jane Adams. She wins a Nobel Peace Prize later uh, um, in world history, which is pretty cool. She also advocated for peace during World War I, and she traveled to Europe to do so. Um, so one of the things is they would hire nurses through donations to visit the sick in their homes, okay, like home care. And by 1900, more than 400 houses had been established in major cities across the country. That's incredible because the movement was only 11 years old at that point. Uh, Lillian Wall in New York City. And then the social gospel movement is very important. 
because uh, the social gospel crowd used Christian teachings to demand better housing and living conditions for the urban poor. The leading uh, exponent was the ba uh, Baptist cleric Walter Rauschenbusch, whose ideas had developed by his ministry in the Hell's Kitchen section of New York City. Uh, and that was a terrible place to live. Uh, he and many others strove for social justice. Okay. There's also this, this movement called the Charity Organization Movement, um, and it was particularly led by the middle class. And they, they really wanted uh, immigrants to adopt American culture and American middle class standards. Um, so uh, basic charities that we would see today in American society. Okay. Now, one of the things the progressives did to campaign for some of these things at the government level was they did statistical research. Today, you have um, research think, think tanks on both the Democrat and Republican side that try to do statistical research to provide evidence for um, cases of, of different uh, bills and laws and so forth. So they did immigration on, uh, so this is on immigration, child labor, uh, economic practices. Uh, they even started vice commissions. Okay, now this is kind of a forgotten part of American history that, that really um, needed to happen. Prostitution was rampant, um, gambling, um, tons of gambling addictions where people squandered their 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 uh, money they made on on gambling uh, and other moral ills um, such as alcohol c consumption, um, uh, uh, por pornography, and so forth being sent out, um, and other um, uh, vices that took place in society and so forth. Now, um, one of the things that pr progressives also led to social research by properly funded foundations delving into industrial conditions. Vice commissions in many cities looking into prostitution and gambling and other things uh, tackled this. Great faith was placed in academic expertise. Frederick W. Taylor had come up with scientific management and factors to eliminate wasteful energy and provide more efficiency. Many progressives believe this could be applied to municipal governments, schools, hospitals, and in the home. Still nowhere were the battle lines more sharply drawn than in the courts, where judges treated the law as if it had risen from eternal principles. In 1905, the Supreme Court ruled in Lochner versus New York that a state law that limited the hours bakers could work was unconstitutional. So really what they're trying to do is they're taking Frederick W. Taylor's idea of creating efficiency in factories to using it for government and schools. And that's actually how schools are run with, with bells and, and uh, desk and, and line order. And you go from one class to the next and so forth. Uh, now, in Lochner versus New York, there was a, a law at the, in the state of New York that said that bakers could only work 10 hours, okay? Now, the reason why it was declared unconstitutional is because at certain times of the year, um, did bakers' business increase, okay? Like around Thanksgiving, Christmas time, uh, Easter, other religious holidays, uh, uh, and so forth. So on those times, they would need to work for more hours because that's where they provide um, greater business, okay? And so one of the things is that, uh, it, it was passed with good intentions, but it needed to allow bakers the flexibility to be able to work longer hours at certain times of the year. Okay. Now, Louis C. Brandeis, a famous Jewish uh, progressive lawyer, he actually became the first uh, Jewish American admitted to the Supreme Court, um, helped argue this case. And one of the things that he did is he won a famous railroad case by demonstrating that railroads operated inefficiently and did not deserve to charge their customers more money. So they're like, look, if you're gonna charge this amount, and there's got to be justification for that. And um, later, President Woodrow Wilson appointed him to the Supreme Court. I want to show you some images of child laborers. Uh, this is a young boy that probably was six to eight years old. You can uh, tell he has no shoes on. Look how dirty uh, his clothing is. This is an article about uh, a young boy falling to, to his death in a coal chute. Um, others about a, a legs being burned. Look at all these, these children coal miners. And one of the reasons why they were valued is because they could fit into tight spaces to get out coal um, and they would get the black lung and die an early death. It was terrible. This is a young girl, knows her hair is cut short. Um, can you imagine if they had a misstep and tripped and you fell into the spinning machines? What maimed body would come out of that? This is a picture taken on the cover of John Spargo, a, a prominent journalist uh, muckraker. And I'll explain what a muckraker is in just a minute. Um, and it's called the bitter cry of children. Now, what he's wearing on his hat was actually a, a lantern for a mine. This was uh, uh, a pamphlet done by the United States government about child labor conditions in tenements. Look at this. Um, this bottom uh, metal thing looks like a, a cheese grater, and uh, the kid's on there barefooted. And one of the reasons why children were, were valued in uh, factories was they could pay them less, number one. 
Number two, that because they were small and small hands, they could fit into machinery to supposedly fix them. Now, this is a personal issue for me because um, two weeks before I went off to college, I had a friend of mine from high school uh, that actually died uh, working for uh, the county road department um, dealing with the box baler literally on his last day of his summer job before he was scheduled to go on vacation with his parents and move off to college two weeks later. Um, and so it was a, it was a freak accident. Um, and there was a lot more safety regulations in 2002 when that took place. Um, but, um, workplace accidents, uh, do occur. They still occur. Um, but at much, 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 much smaller levels than they did at this time. These are kids shorting through uh, coal here. You can see the coal dust in the image. These are young girls working in a textile mill. These are kids protesting, wanting to go to school. Can you imagine? I'll show this to my high school students. And they're always like, no, no, man, we don't like school. But you look at this. These kids were begging to go to school instead of working in factories. Um, here's uh, another image of an industrial factory with children, young boys, maybe 12, 13, 14 years old. This is a painting of kids uh, shucking peas. Here's another kid. Look how he's, his uh, uh, um Overalls are barely, barely being held up. So who are the muckrakers? Uh, muckrakers are journalists. Uh, the name came from Teddy Roosevelt. I'll explain in just a minute. Uh, but these were people who um, worked for different uh, uh, magazines like Hoggers and McClure's um, who would um, really write things for the middle class readers to try to get them to provoke to want to enact change. What they would dig is they, they would dig up um, – corruption and dirt on uh, businesses, uh, like standard oil. Uh, they would write about child labor. They would write about segregation. They would write about other different issues. Now, Teddy Roosevelt called them muckrakers because um, he said, yes, they're bringing um, some bad things to light, but oftentimes if all they do is focus on negative, 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 it can lead to a very cynical society. And uh, like Lincoln Steffens wrote on the, sh the shame of the cities about city corruption with political machines, um, Ida Tarbell attacked Standard Oil Monopoly after her father died of alcoholism once he was fired from Standard Oil. David Graham Phillips told how money controlled the Senate, which we called the Millionaire's Club. William Hart exposed industrial accidents in making steel and killing men. Uh, and also he wrote about child labor in The Kid what Works at Night, or sorry, Who Works at Night. Uh, Jacob Rees published How the Other Half Lives. This is probably the most famous one. He showed images of how the terrible living conditions for immigrants and uh, the urban poor and and uh, these these uh, these uh, uh, apartments. Uh, one of the ones that is probably the most well known, other than Jacob Reese's How the Other Half Lives, is Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. Now, Upton Sinclair actually was a socialist, um, and some of these many of these muckrakers actually were socialist, um, which kind of drove some of their uh, their findings and so forth. Uh, but if they could, they believed though, if, if if you could read it or see it with images, it would lead you wanting to to enact reform. Okay. Now, up in Sinclair is the jungle. I had to read it in high school. Uh, it, it does make you want to throw up. Uh, what he actually wrote about uh, was the meatpacking industry. Now, he actually wrote the, the short story um, about the plight of the workers because what was happening is this, uh, some of these meatpacking plants were selling supposedly what was smoked sausage. And actually what it was, was it was pork dipped in acid to make it look like it was smoked. Okay, that's wrong on, on many levels. Um, and the acid that the, these workers were handling were, um, were wilting away slowly their fingers. Um, their fingernails were gone. They were, as they were uh, uh, cutting different meats, um, you'd have rats that would accidentally fall into the sausage vats. Um, people would accidentally cut off fingers or, and so forth. And supposedly that was mixed in with the meat. I mean, oh, it was, it was terrible as you can imagine. Um, and really this, when it gets read, uh, People were like, we got to change something. In fact, Teddy Roosevelt, when he read it, um, they had the uh, Meat Inspection Act passed um, at the national level that regulated all meat sold um, across state lines. And so today, because of the Federal Meat Inspection Act of 1906, uh, any meat that is sold is rated by the Food and Drug Administration, um, graded on A, B, C, or D. Anything below grade D cannot be sold to the human population. It can be used for uh, pet food and so forth. But um, so I remember years ago, Taco Bell got uh, under some um, um, heat uh, from the public because they were using grade D meat in their uh, in their uh, uh, food. And what was interesting was um, 
that uh, um, they kind of they really had cheap prices. And, and then uh, whenever this came out, they started using better quality meat, but then the prices went up. So you get what you pay for, literally, uh, and so forth. OK, uh, one of the things that these muckrakers also attacked was the practices of life insurance companies, tariff lobbies, the beef trust, the money trust, uh, the railroad barons, any corrupt amassing of American fortunes. Muckrakers did not stop at business practices. They went off. They went after social evils such as prostitution, slums and industrial accidents. Ray Standard Baker wrote about the subjugation of blacks in the country, while John Spargo wrote about child labor issues. They even attacked potent uh, uh, patent medicines that were simply a bunch of alcohol that was had coloring in it to right social wrongs that count on publicity and arouse public conscience, not drastic political change. They wanted to cleanse capitalism instead of overthrowing it. Some of them actually want to get rid of capitalism because they were socialists like up in Sinclair. All right. So uh, one of the things about progressive era is they wanted to enact social justice at the local state and national level. And so one of the things about the muckrakers, they were trying to expose things at the local level, the state level and the national level. You have to understand all three levels of government. Most of the progressive era uh, uh, reforms come at the local and state level. National level, there's some big ones that are very important, and we'll talk about those. Um, there's a lot of stuff enacted at the state and local level. Okay, so also they won't do the same thing with political democracy. And uh, we do have three progressive presidents: Roosevelt, Taft, and Woodrow Wilson. Two Republicans, one Democrat. Okay, so here are some of the the uh, muckrakers and what they wrote about. You can read these. Okay and so forth. Thomas Nass was kind of the first one who, who you did political cartoons in the 1870s to bring down Tammany Hall's political machine led by Boss Tweed. Um, but Jane Adams, who was a social um, reformer, uh, part of the social gospel movement, um, and then Margaret Sanger, she founded um, what became Planned Parenthood, um, and she educated uh, people about birth control. Now, the contraception pill doesn't come about till 1960, but Margaret Sanger uh, encouraged uh, uh, planning pregnancies and so forth. Now, Margaret Sanger, what um, oftentimes is, is forgotten in history, she, she did favor eugenics, uh, which is preventing certain groups from reproducing uh, and so forth. And she was actually quite, uh, quite racist if you read some of her, her primary sources. Frank Norris um, wrote about the railroads. Otto Tarbell wrote about Standard Oil. Booker T. Washington uh, found the Tuskegee Institute Education um, Institute for African Americans and, and talked about the economic problems for African Americans. Webb Du Bois uh, talked about segregation. At the city level, one of the things is that city governments are going to improve. Um, the things that actually lead to city governments improving was two um, disasters, one natural and one man-made. Uh, the one that was natural was the Galveston hurricane of 1900 in Texas. It was, it's, it's still today the deadliest hurricane in American history. 8,000 individuals died, estimated, from the Galveston hurricane. Now, we've had worse hurricanes in terms of, of uh, wind speed and, and, and sure volume of rain and so forth. But what was so bad about the Galveston hurricane is there was no early warning system. So for the cleanup, they had to develop different city offices to handle this. Like they had a Department of, of Sanitation, a city commissioner. Um, you had uh, later a Parks and Recreation that was developed. And so uh, you had a department that dealt with zoning and so forth. Now, the man-made cause disaster what is what's called the Johnstown Flood, and it is tragic. Um, it, um, it was a, 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 a town that was on the border of Ohio and Pennsylvania. It was like literally this town, Ohio, just on the other side of, 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 of Pennsylvania. There was a hunting and fishing club for a lot of uh, wealthy industrialists outside of Pittsburgh. Um, and they had this man-made um, kind of reservoir area that had a dike that uh, prevented it from uh, overflowing. Well, um, the some wealthy individuals, part of the hunting and fishing club, wanted to be able to take their horse carriage across the dike. So I'm not exactly sure of the engineering aspect of it, but they had to kind of... Uh, they weakened the dike to make it where they could go across in a horse carriage. Well, they had torrential rain for several days. Well, the dike gave way um, and they didn't get word to the, to the town in time to evacuate. And the reservoir flowed down the valley and literally swept away the city. And they found bodies as far away as Cincinnati down the Ohio River and men, women and children. It is it is devastating. It is a, a disaster 
forgotten in American history oftentimes, but there used to be a, a day every year that people would recognize uh, the Johnstown flood in the 1890s for 50 plus years until the 1950s. And so um, that cleanup effort led to the creation of, of different city departments. Today, cities across the United States have different departments to create greater efficiency in how they operate. Okay. Um, Here's some pictures of the muckrakers and so forth. All right, we will stop there and we will come back to the Ashcan School of Heart in part two.